Thank you very much. We think of posterior instability in three terms. Number one, the dynamic instabilities, which are recurrent posterior instability, very often positional, or the static posterior instability, which is uh, an instability which does not have instability symptoms, but it has some pain, and the head is, uh, is decentered posteriorly. Now, if we look at dynamic posterior instability, and I take mostly our own data, uh, there is a concept that it is due to hyperlaxity. Posterior inferior capsule shift does not really work well. And if I say it does not work well, I speak about around 20% of recurrences. Now, if I think of 20% recurrences, I think of Zurich Airport. 750 landings per day, 150 crashes. So. That's probably not a very good system, okay? Glenoid retroversion, glenoid osteotomy does not work. It creates osteoarthritis. Posterior bone block, our data, does not really work well. They're not, they're okay early, but then they also uh, create uh, posterior uh, erosion. And muscle coordination, pacemaker does improve these patients some, but never cures them. Let us go through what we have found. This is a typical case of a B0 glenoid. And I would really like that at the end of this talk, you understand that this terminology has hurt us very much. Because this is not a B1 or B0 glenoid, but a B0 or B1 scapula. And if we do not think scapula will not solve the problem. What do we know? We know that static posterior subluxation is progressive. It is always progressive, and it leads to eccentric osteoarthritis. Very important to remember. So it's progressive, it leads to eccentric osteoarthritis. Now, what is it all about? We don't understand it. We, we don't understand why that happens. Who of you knows why there is posterior escape? Well, I had an experience. You may know that it is very easy to do posterior bankard. Posterior bankards are much easier than anterior bankards. And with this case here, I tried to do a posterior bankard and I got always into subacromial space rather than into the joint. That was not the first arthroscopy that I had done. So I looked at the x-ray and I saw that the acromion is extremely high and the acromion is extremely horizontal. So we said, well, we, we better look at, at whether there is something systematic there. But you see here, so we were astonished to see that because that's not normal and asked ourselves, well, is this, a, is this a systematic pathology? And then we looked at the acromion in instability. Just use the near view. Look at the posterior instability case on the left and the anterior instability at the right. I can tell you, yesterday we had a session on B1 and B2 glenoids. 100% of the cases that were presented had an acromion, as you see on the left side. Nobody was alluding to it, nobody was talking about it, but it was absolutely constant. So what we saw here, we wanted to know, is this systematically so? And what you see here is that on the right side, in a normal or anterior instability case, the posterior inferior angle of the acromion is clearly within the glenoid. It's about, from the center of the glenoid, it's about, is less than 20 millimeters above. In the inferior, in the posterior instability, it is much, much, much higher, and you can see that the head can be pushed out the back, which is also the reason that Scapinelli had the thumb test, which showed that if you hold your thumb posteriorly, the patient cannot subluxate anymore posteriorly. So, we systematically looked at posterior acromial morphology and found in this JBJS article that it is significantly associated with posterior shoulder instability. And what we measured was the posterior acromial tilt, 
posterior acromial height, that is the PAH, that's the inferior part of the posterior lateral aspect of the acromion and the center of the glenoid, this posterior acromial height, and the posterior acromial coverage. It's a coverage wing, uh, angle that you see there. Now, if we saw that, we uh, measured that and we could see that the posterior acromial height in posterior shoulder instability is highly significantly different from normal and from anterior instability. And in this series, if you had a posterior acromial height of more than 23 millimeters, your odds ratio for posterior shoulder instability was 32. If we looked at the posterior acromial coverage, exactly the same thing was found. And the posterior acromion is much, much higher and covers the head much poorly. So we did a 3D study and looked at first normal shoulders, then uh, dynamic posterior instability and static posterior instability and measured them in a three-dimensional fashion. First, we created and then we created a scapular mean statistical shape model for the normal shoulder. If we, con if we look at what we found, there were things that we did know, like the retroversion of the control group was less, was, was, was less, there was less retroversion than the dynamic, and there was even more for the static posterior instabilities. What we had not known was that the posterior instabilities have a more inferiorly inclined glenoid. And you may say it's not that much, but it's five degrees, four to five degrees, and four to five degrees you would correct in a total knee. But then we looked at the acromion. Now, if you look at the acromion, the acromion tilt was uh, very different by, between the normals and the, the instability cases. The posterior coverage was highly significantly different, and the posterior height was sort of day and night. And between the dynamic and the static, there was only one significant difference. The only significant difference was that the statics have a shorter acromion. Now, what does a short acromion mean? A short acromion leads to osteoarthritis. That is clear, small CSA associated with arthritis. So you have a posterior instability and a very short acromion. What does that mean? Well, we could show the typical acromion of static posterior instability in the young is identical to the acromial anatomy of eccentric osteoarthritis of the elderly. Here you see concentric osteoarthritis with a normal acromion and eccentric osteoarthritis, and they have a horizontal acromion. So what happens? If you look in concentric and eccentric osteoarthritis, the shoulder does not allow to go out, is not allowed to go back out upon elevation when you have a chalet type uh, acromion. Now, we know that small anterior posterior inclination of the acromion is a predictor for posterior glenohumeral erosion. And for posterior subluxation to occur, the small CSA has to be associated with horizontal acromion. This is a mean statistical shape model created from 40 normal shoulders three-dimensionally. Now, when we have instability, we looked at the cases that we had had. Here, the second play, the second uh, green one, uh, the, the, the pink one, is a static posterior instability. And that static instability is first corrected only at the glenoid side. Then the acromion is corrected, and then both things are corrected. This is a study that my fellow Bettina Hochreiter did, and look what happens if you are in 60 degrees of flexion 
and you have a, a very crude mechanical system, you see that the head very early abuts against the posterior deltoid and against the acromion. Now what happens in the situation of a B1 glenoid? Look what happens if the arm is elevated. The arm that is elevated just very simply dislocates. And it cannot dislocate with the normal acromion. So if we look at the comparison between a patient's uh, scapula and the scapula of a mean statistical shape model, you see here in uh, pink the glenoid, which has to be corrected along that axis to be back with normal. And you see the acromion of the patient in blue and the normal acromion in green. Now, how do you have to correct that? You see that in the middle, you have to take out the wedge and tilt it downwards. But in addition, you have to lateralize it. So that was a patient, 41 years old, left side, has slight limitation of internal rotation, has a clear B1 or B0, B1, with a typical acromion on the right. And if you see here, that's his preoperative x-rays. That's the planning of the correction. This is how the correction takes place. And you see that the acromion has to be lowered and lateralized to restore normal anatomy. This is the post-operative image, and that is him at two years. It is the only patient of whom I know where B0, B1 could be restored to normal with two years without additional OA. That is his clinical follow-up. His subjective shoulder value is 100%. So what about the dynamic cases? This is a 25-year-old with a disabling recurrent posterior instability, two previous posterior, one anterior stabilization. Look in the middle at the acromion and look at the dynamic and static posterior instability. That's what it looked like at the end when we treated him. He was not able to elevate the arm higher, subjective shoulder value 20%. He was not able to do that because he dislocated when he went up higher. So the correction was complex in so far as we had to correct as well the glenoid as the acromion, which had to be tilted and lateralized quite a bit. On the right side, you see that the acromion is much too medial for covering the head. So this is the correction of the acromion fixed with two screws. This is the post-op radiograph. This is him at 18 month follow up, and he may not be completely recentered, but he's completely stable, working 100%. We have a total of nine patients. There is one complete failure, and the complete failure is due to our current main problem. It is very difficult to execute precisely this operation. And the one failure that is really a failure, also a radiographic failure, we could show that we have not corrected what we wanted to correct. The ones that we could correct have been doing better. The pain has gone from pain-free 15 points from 6 to 14. There is nobody who has a residual subjective instability. The scapular humeral subluxation index, we were talking about that yesterday, has been corrected from 70 to 58. The glenohumeral subluxation index was already good before, but if we look at eccentric shoulders, we had preoperatively, we had four, postoperatively, we had still five at two, and the improvement of subluxation was four times, and one, the failed, was worse. This is a patient where I hesitated somewhat because he had already some arthritis and uh, had a static and dynamic posterior subluxation. That's the post-operative correction. That's him at one year follow-up. And that is his uh, follow-up at one year. I think he has some arthritis. He already had some arthritis, but he's recentered and quite happy with that. So, Scapular and specifically acromial anatomy is abnormal. 
as well in static and in dynamic posterior shoulder instability. Static and dynamic posterior instability are similar. And interestingly, eccentric osteoarthritis has exactly the same acromial abnormalities as static posterior subluxation. The normal acromion is an effective secondary restraint to posterior humeral escape. And scapular corrective osteotomies for posterior escape can restore, they do not always restore, but they can restore posterior stability to normal and are clinically safe and promising. I can add that I know that there are two studies out which have looked at these parameters in failed posterior reconstructions, and they are highly significantly different compared with those that were successful posterior bankers. Thank you very much.